of those 2%, 5% claim to be Christian. All right, so when you're looking at about uh, six and a half million indigenous people, of, of which 5% um, claim as their founding religion is Christianity, it's a fairly small number of people um, that claim in that, in that status. And in fact, my brother intends the Church of the Indian Fellowship over in uh, Puyallup, just actually to call them a few right between. And their pastor, Reverend Herb Porter, has said that he gets a lot of um, people, indigenous people, upset with him because he's claimed Christianity. Given Christianity has been the source through the doctrine of discovery, a lot of evil and a lot of destruction of the indigenous peoples of this land. So you're looking at a small group of people that really do get a lot of flack for claiming Christianity. And in, in, in this case, as we listen to this conversation, they're trying to resolve that even through the, the passages, in this case of the New Testament, to make it speak to them in a way um, that shares their uh, absorption or a part of Christianity, but in a way that means something to them. So, and words are important. I mean, it was even just looking this last week again at the English word God. Where did that come from? I mean, when you look at uh, Greek, it was theos. When you're looking at Hebrew, that Adonai, Elohim, Yahweh, El, which we all in English translate as God. Um, you look at the Latin, Deus, which is considered to come from the, the Greek Zeus, um, is where that came from. Um, so you look further, and it looks like it's Gut was a Germanic deities, plural, um, of um, Northern Europe a long time ago. And that became kind of a Gut, a Gott, um, that the German people look at, um, my Gott. Um, and so, and that English translation came to God. And, and what does that mean to indigenous people? I mean, even we have acknowledged a certain um, Western European understanding and use the word God. So they're trying to make it meaningful for them. So as you'll hear here in a few minutes, that might be a great spirit, great mystery, creator. All of those express a meaning of what we may call God. Um, this conversation, Terry Wildman and uh, Mark Charles, um, goes into, he speaks more of how, how it all started in creating this translation. And I'll let their voices speak for what they have to say for us. Today, to bring Terry Wildman onto our second cup of coffee, let him bring him on here, and I will allow him to introduce himself uh, Terry is from the uh, Ojibwe and the Yaki Nation, and uh, he is a tremendous advocate for Native issues, and especially in sharing his faith and helping people to walk in better relationship with the Creator and one another. So, Terry, thank you for joining me this morning. Um, the floor is yours. Please introduce yourself. Thanks for joining right. me today. Well, thank you, Mark, for just inviting me in here. And, uh, to, uh, and, and with all your friends and followers here, um, uh, I'll say, Bujuni Ji, the Madise. Hello, my friends who share this life together with me. Uh, that's in Ojibwe. Uh, uh, my, uh, my ancestry, my native ancestry, comes from the Ojibwe in the Great Lakes region, uh, primarily from Ontario. Uh, um, and I grew up in Michigan the land of the Anishinaabe, and the Three Fires people. Um, I also have a Yaki ancestry to my grandma. My grandpa went all the way down to, uh, from Michigan. Uh, he drove all the way down to uh, Bisbee, Arizona, and worked the, the copper mines during the Depression, depression time. And, and then he met my grandma at a boarding house and whirlwind romance took her to the Tombstone Courthouse, married her, 
and took her back to Michigan. And so my grandma is Yankee. And uh, she, uh, her, her mother brought her over across the border and she grew up in Globe, Arizona. My, my grandma did. And, uh, and she spoke perfect English and Spanish. Spanish, of course, being the colonial language in, Me in Mexico. Uh, so anyway, uh, my wife and I, my wife Darlene and I live in Maricopa, Arizona. We live on the traditional lands of the Pima and the Tonawan, and we we uh, we have made um, some good uh, relationships uh, here since we've lived here. We, uh, my wife and I lived here four years, and then we moved to Michigan for four years, and then we came back. We've been here about three years now, all through the COVID uh, time uh, that that has really. Uh, changed the world in so many ways and it's changed our lives and I imagine the lives of people uh, all around. So it's it's so good to be here uh, and with everybody. So thank you for welcoming. Well, thank you, Terry. Um, thank you for that introduction and that land acknowledgement. I see we have Andrea in with us. We have someone new, uh, Rev. SJ Doctor, SJDR. Um, seems like that that person is very aware of your first virgin, first nation virgin. In fact, they have a comment here that this is the only virgin they use in their family right now. Yeah, so um, great. Thanks for thanks for joining us. We have Sherlyn Lewis this morning with us. Uh Shan, Shankina is here. Uh, Terry is with us, Mr. Phil Fox, thank you for joining. Um, as well as uh, Miles. So I want to thank everybody for being online with us this morning. And uh, we're going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes and just talk about some of Terry's work. If you have a question you'd like to pose to Terry about his First Nation version that he's been working on the translation or about his life or ministry, feel free to put it into the chat. Um, maybe preface it with a word question or something like that so we can find it later. And I'll try to devote the last five minutes or so of this uh, interview and this conversation so we can pose some questions to Terry directly from our audience. Um, but uh, so Terry, you and I first met, it was probably 15 years ago, I'm guessing. Um, yeah. We were living on the Navajo Reservation, on the Navajo Nation. I don't believe we were in our Hogan. I think we had, sent, we had moved from there to Fort Defiance. And uh, you and Darlene visited us. You and I were just going over this time. Like you visited us in Fort Defiance. And at one point, my son and I came down and spent some time with you. Um, in Maricopa. And um, I know we talked about a lot of things there. I don't recall talking about a First Nation version of the Bible. Um, I'm curious, if, when did you first get the vision to do this translation? And what was kind of the, what was kind of the, the what was pressing you to, to put so much, because I know you've been working on this for years now, what, what was kind of the Trust you to put so much effort and so much um, energy into getting this version um, into the hands of people like it is today. You know, back in the year 2000, <clears throat> which was how long has that been? Uh, <laughs> Quite two years. <laughs> my wife and I moved down to the Hopi Indian Reservation in Northern Arizona. And uh, at that time, we were just kind of ignorant missionaries. Uh, you know, Personally, even though I have Yaki and Ojibwe ancestry, I was not raised in the context of my culture. And so I wanted to learn as much as I could. So moving on the Hopi rest, and the Hopi being a quite traditional people, even today, uh, they have held on to, uh, to their traditions, maybe in ways uh, that others have, have, haven't been able to do. Uh, and so, uh, Living there just made me realize as I just uh, I joined a, an organization called Youth with a Mission, and we began to just uh, uh, from there just learn. And I just realized how ignorant I was. But what happened along the way, as I would uh, we would have small gatherings and talking circles. I would go into the Hopi jail sometimes, uh, and and and. And we would work on things, and I just began to see that the standard English translations of the Bible weren't connecting very well. I didn't know what the answer was to it. Um, but later, after I left Youth with a Mission, we decided to uh, uh, 
um, pastor of a small church on Second Mesa uh, that was uh, the, sun, the Sunlight uh, Mission there, the Sunlight Mission. And, and from there, I, I found a case of Hopi Bibles translated in the Hopi language. And, and they were stored away. And no, we didn't use them in the church gatherings. I never saw a church gathering where the Hopi Bible was read from. And so I just began to ask around. I began to ask questions. And what happened was I learned that, that most people, over 99% of the people there, couldn't even begin to read from the Hopi Bible, so it wasn't being used. And this made me start to question some things. Uh, and and though that questioning went on for years. It wasn't like I sat out to plan on doing a, a new translation of the scriptures. As a matter of fact, that was the farthest thing from my imagination. But I did begin to question a lot of things. And along the way, I was learning uh, the story. And I went through my own crisis of faith during this time. And I began to see that I had been pre-programmed and pre-taught certain things about uh, Christianity, about God, about Jesus, about Native people and, and Native ways. And I, I, I found out that I had to unlearn so much. And in that process, after about three years there, I think it was around 2003, I just began after researching to see that that there hadn't been an English translation. I found out that probably over 90% of our Native people, because of the boarding schools, because of the, the, the uh, which were run many times by, by Christian organizations and, and mission organizations and churches, ran these boarding schools that was taking away our language. So at the same time, some missionaries were translating uh, the Bible into our Native language. Other missionaries were taking our language away from us, stripping us of that language. And so we were never encouraged to learn to, to read our languages and, and to, or taught to, to, uh, to do that. So these Bibles uh, often ended up in storage facilities. So, uh, so over the years, I began to experiment with this idea that we needed an English translation that would um, that would help Native people kind of decol decolonize the, the scriptures. Um, and so I began to work right with the Native people I was with, with Hopi men, Hopi women, some of the Diné people, the Navajo people, and just began to experiment with this idea of rewording the scriptures uh, to relate to, to our Native people, to use words in English that, that was closer to maybe our heart language, the way our elders might have spoken to us. And so it took, you know, starting in 2003, just experimenting with this and getting feedback, it took until about 2012 before I actually thought, I need to do this. I couldn't find anyone else that wanted to do it. I couldn't find anyone else that was uh, that was involved in it. So I just began the process myself with the help of some, some uh, friends. And so that's kind of sh the short version. Uh, there were some steps along the way that I missed, but that's kind of where it came from and it grew from there. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that story. Because So that fits right in with our timeline, right? So I was kind of meeting you and we were getting to know each other well you were kind of playing with this idea but it wasn't a concrete goal mm -hmm. or let's get this together but um, i do remember talking with you about your work with youth with, with um in zuni and with youth youth with a mission yeah um, and what you were doing there i want to share with people there's a link so there's a, a, a website online it's a website made by terry called just the first nations version.com and in there, there is a link where you can, there's links where you can purchase a version of the Bible, as well as where you can download samples of the Bible. And so, for example, let me just, I'm going to put this uh, version up on the screen for a moment and just allow people to see briefly, and I'll, I'll read one of the examples. So if we take John 3.16, right, this is a very common, trans, or a common verse that most people know. And in the First Nations version, this is how it reads. 
The great spirit loves this world of human beings so deeply he gave us his son, the only son who fully represents him. All who trust in him and his way will not come to a bad end, but will have the life of the world to come that never fades, full of beauty and harmony. Creator did not send his son to decide against the people of this world, but set, but to set them free from the from the worthless ways of the world. Now, for people who know <laughs> the, the, these versions of the Bible, right? Um, I mean, that's going to sound different. Yeah. So maybe walk us through what are some of the changes you made? Because I know you had like you tried to be very consistent. You just didn't translate each one. So but you tried to use consistent words and phrases and you you applied different names consistently throughout the gospels and throughout the letters. How did that work? Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Well, in the beginning, I tried to imagine, uh, you know, after living with the Hopi and getting to know traditional people, listening to the elders listening to how they spoke, especially when they spoke of sacred things. And as I, as I listened to that, and as, I, I tried to imagine what would, what would uh, how would, say, Black Elk? A lot of people have read his books. You know, I know they're translated from, uh, you know, uh, there, but a lot of that translation of Chief Joseph or some of these, these early elders who, when it was translated to English, it came closer to almost uh, word for word from their own uh, indigenous languages. So I tried to imagine, what if an elder was telling the story of the Bible, of Jesus, mostly of Jesus, you know? Uh, what, what would it sound like if, it, if one of these, these native elders uh, who, who still held on to their traditional identities very strongly, what if they were telling the story? What might it sound like? And, and, and again, we don't pretend uh, that we're representing all Native people in doing this translation. We have a council of 12, and we've had over 25 Indigenous Native people from, from this land, from all many different tribes, many different geographical regions, have all been involved in the wording of this translation. But we intentionally uh, my vision was to intentionally stay away from certain kinds of words because there are certain words and ways that it's translated because of the boarding school experience. Um, you know, we use the word, I'll, I'll use an example, the word sin. Well, how do you understand the word sin? What is a sin? You know, and, and, and you know, we use it, all, it's used all the time, but in boarding school, it was a sin to speak our language. It was a sin to wear our hair long. It was a sin to pray with a feather or to pray with smoke. And so that word sin kind of got mixed up into removing our nativeness from us and removing our identity. And it was used improperly by the dominant society and dominant uh, uh, culture to, you know, use a spiritual book like the story of Jesus to try to force this way on us and to make us feel guilty about who we are as a people and that creator can't accept us as native people. We have to change and be like the, the colonizers and, and to follow him. So I wanted to imagine that the idea that we would use words that, that wouldn't immediately set barriers up against the message of Jesus creator sets free and let native people decide for themselves. You know, it's been forced on us for so many years, but if native people can decide for themselves. I know that traditionally, uh, I've talked to so many elders, we're always open to spiritual ways of other people. What, you know, and it's sad that, that so many of us now, because of this colonial, uh, Experiment, I guess you would call it, um, have a what I call a, a, a kind of a warped view of who Jesus Greater Sense Free is. And we were hoping that maybe through this translation, it would open up ways of looking at Jesus that are non colonial. And I think even at the end there, you use the you know, translated phrase for Jesus, right? 
Right. Because you use Jesus throughout the scripture. What's the, the phrase that you use? We use creator sets free. And one of the things that um, I learned from, um, uh, I've, I've been through a mentoring process with a lot of my, uh, with, with the Anishinaabe elders and, and, and things. And I learned uh, that, that traditionally we were, uh, our names all had meanings. There was meanings behind our names. And I, and I looked into the scriptures and the Hebrew people, there were meanings behind every name. And sometimes even the meanings of the name added depth to the story that was being told. Like, for example, father of many nations, Abraham. So we actually looked into the meaning in the original Hebrew and Greek language of every name in the New Testament and every place in the New Testament and gave it a the meaning of that name with a native field. Okay. That's fascinating. You know, I, I, I have a question for you. Just This is almost out of, out of fun. So besides creator sets free, okay, what is one of the names you use in your translation that you just love, right? You're just like, I love that name. It, it's whatever it was. What was. What's one of your favorite names that you used in this translation? Well, I kind of like, um, you know, uh, small, small man is Paul. And he wrote a letter to a, a people uh, called, in that letter, the people were Galatians, right? Yeah. And Galatians means land of pale skin. <laughs> I, just, I just thought, wow, you know, <laughs> what a perfect thing to get to put in the scriptures in this sacred book, and you know, uh, and, and just because that's what it means, you can look yeah. it up in, in the language. So that you know, I, I guess from that point of view, I had a little bit of a fun with that idea and of how that might impact a lot of people, and it might make. It might actually wake some people up. What? <laughs> you know, what is he talking about? There. You know. What's one of the names that generated the most debate or discussion amongst your your team as you were trying to decide on which one? What what name did you kind of have the put the most effort into? A lot of different opinions and making sure that you got it right. Well, wow, that's a really good question. I haven't thought about that for a while. You know, as we try to um, uh, uh, look at uh, what to call God, right? I mean, what is what is this name God? What is this word God? What does it mean? I remember I wrote I wrote I read a book something I think it was called uh, from a missionary, the Wycliffe missionary, who translated the scriptures into Navajo, and and uh, and they used the word God. Dien God. Yeah. And so early on, the, the, the Navajo people were kind of like, God, what do you mean, God? Uh, yeah. and, it, and of course, it, uh, later when they got a Christmas tree and they put the Christmas tree up, they go, oh, yeah, good, good. <laughs> it's a juniper. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's the nature of this spirit, this powerful spirit. And, 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 uh, and so, uh, you know, it's so for us finding the right term, but, but the, where we the challenge for us was uh, we couldn't be tri always tribally specific. We were trying to have a, a general way that most uh, Native people might refer to the Supreme Being. So we used terms like Great Spirit. Some people, some of our team didn't like Great Spirit. They thought it was too Hollywood or too this or that. So we had to work through all that Great Spirit, Creator. We used some other terms, uh, giver of breath, maker of life. We, we kind of searched for some, some, uh, some versions, Great Mystery for like the Anishinaabe people. And then we just freely used that to replace the word God, God which is a German origin word. It, it comes, it really has very little meaning to anybody uh, yeah. except except that we apply meaning to it. When I hear about you talk about your process of going through this and the input you got from people of different nations, I, I can't help but think about my grandfather 
who was a translator for some of the missionaries, the white missionaries to our Navajo people, he even helped translate some of the hymns and even some of the Bible. And he would get in trouble, right? Because they would preach and they would say their thing and they would use a term and then my, my grandfather would talk for two or three minutes, even though they only said a few sentences. And they would say, are you adding to our message? What are you doing? He's like, no, I'm, I'm trying to capture what you're saying, right? I can't just translate this directly over. And so he was having that committee meeting in his head, right? As, <laughs> as how can I best explain the concept of sin or the idea of, of redemption or whatever, you know, to my people who are not going to have this, whatever background you need to have to, to understand these in the English sense. And so I, it really kind of warmed my heart to hear about the dialogue and the discussion and even some of the back and forth that you had during that process. And I, I, think, I, I think of my grandfather, how incredible of a tool would that have been had he been able to have those types of dialogues um, when he was doing his work, um, you know, 60, 70, even 80 years ago. Uh, one other question I want to ask you. So when when you're when the, this translation Bible first came out, there was we were in the midst of, of COVID, and there was supply chain shortages, and almost immediately they sold out of the paperback copies, mm -hmm. and they only had the, the electronic ebook versions um, for several months, I believe. Yeah. Um, and now you know if you look on if you talk to University Press or if you look online even Amazon, the, you're this translation is selling very well. What have you seen as some of the, both the challenges of getting this book out there now that it's published? And what are some of the, the, the stories of, um, this is what it's accomplished, or this is the feedback we're getting from it. You know, what, what are some of the, the different responses you're getting and challenges you've seen as you try to get this version into the hands of people? Yeah, um, well, you know, when you're when you take a book and turn it over to the publisher, you lose a lot of. There's not much you can do from that point on except ask them what's happening. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then they say, oh, it sold out completely, like within the first month. Everything, every copy we had, and now we can't get more because the supply chain issues. We don't have the right kind of paper, and they're trying to figure out do we use a different kind of paper, which would make it thick and bulky and different things like that and so to me it was it was just it, it was it was a challenge i would get emails several emails a week of, of you know um native people who who are uh, pastors and ministers out there who are just desperate to get more copies of this yeah. and and they can't get them why can't i get them we need them i need i need 50 copies, I need 100 copies, I need, uh, someone said they needed uh, uh, 1,000 copies, 1,500, and so I'm, I'm writing the publisher, University Press, hey guys, what's going on, what are we doing, uh, you know, and then, I, and then I would just start writing back to everybody saying, we need your prayers, <laughs> we need your prayers, will you join us in prayer? We feel the same way you do about it. We have a friend, Bruce Plummer, from, um, he's a Cinem, uh, I think he's a Cinnaboy, and uh, he's from the Bel Fort Belknap, what we call, what's called the Fort Belknap Reservation in Montana. And he's got a very successful ministry there. And he believes uh, that he's told me that he believes Creator has told him to raise the money to get to buy 50,000 copies of this and to distribute it in, all over uh, Indian country, everywhere. And he's already been, he's raised over $5,000. He's out there, he gets in his truck and he goes, drives to a reservation where he has relationships and gets them in the hands of people and gets them out there. And he believes that this translation may really make a difference. And that, that to me, is when I know that Native people is making a difference with Native people, that's good. Now, on the other side of it, um, non-Native people like to like this translation. And at first, that concerned me a little bit. And then I thought, okay, 
This is raising awareness. Yeah. It's raising awareness. You know, we have an opening dedication that talks about why we did the First Nation version and, and how that we hope that the years uh, where our, our language and our culture and our uh, identities were uh, stolen from us by, by the government and by the church, that this book could begin a process, maybe a step in the right direction. We don't think this is the answer to everything, but, but if it'll open more hearts just to ask some good questions, to take a new look, that, that's what we, we like. But for Native people, we've had several testimonies of people coming to faith just from reading it, Native, Native people. Uh, one lady gave a man who was, who was anti-Christian, he was just like majorly anti-Christian, and she gave him a copy of the early version you had, you just showed. Yeah. And and it changed. He, he says, oh, I get it now. It wasn't <laughs> Jesus who did these things. <laughs> and, and, and he says, I love Jesus. He was, he's more Indian than I am. <laughs> so things like that really bless me. Those stories are such an encouragement to hear um, because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of talk in the broader church about deconstructing faith. And in a lot of indigenous circles that you and I move in, we've been using the understanding of, for almost, I mean, I've been hearing this for decades now, we've decolonizing our faith. You know? um, and I think in some ways, those things are very, very similar. Um, we just see it as colonial, whereas the rest of the broader church will see it using a different um, paradigm. Right. But I think, yeah, the, the more that we can decolonize or deconstruct kind of what was, what was put out there, and the way it was delivered, you know, I even in our book uh, on Southern Truths, I I talk, I just was doing an interview about that the other day, and someone was asking about, about some of the content of our book, and I said, well, the problem with the majority of the church is they don't know who Jesus is, right? They, they don't know what he actually did or taught because the, his message has been so um, co-opted and colonized and, and institutionalized and made to fit these certain narratives that they literally lost so much of who he was and what he actually said. Um, and so to hear stories of people, even Native people, reading this version and having it unlock something for them is very encouraging for me. I want to just look through some of the comments here. Um, I, I, I have this comment here by um, uh, Ida, who says, the great mystery. I really like that name. He is a great mystery. The Bible is part of what he wants us to know about him. God is not locked inside the Bible or just in box of the Bible. Um, he is the great mystery. And uh, just great encouragement for the use of that term. Um, we have uh, we have Gregory who said, there you think the first nation works in it. Go ahead and stop it right there. We may just go through again some comments that are made and kind of finish up some discussion. And I'm going to show you, and we'll read through some comparisons of the New Revised Standard Version and the Indigenous Version, the First Nations Version here in a minute. Uh, I wondered if there were just any general comments that you wanted to make regarding what you were just listening to with this conversation. I thought it was interesting that one of the terms for God, I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was something like breath, God, or wind, and that's often how we also think of God as, as air, breath. That's just it. He was just talking about the fellow who said, I love Jesus more Indian than I am. It made me think about the title that Jesus uses for himself most often in the Gospels is Son of Man, which means the human one. And that's the idea. He's more human than we are because he's connected with God in a way that we're not, which is very much the part of the Gospel. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Just a thought of perhaps a larger context is that the uh, original New Testament uh, texts that uh, were codified in, in the third four centuries are, are all Greek. But most, like, most likely that 
the, uh, uh, the people in Galilee were not speaking Greek, they were speaking a uh, proto Aramaic. And uh, if you look at some of the other um, uh, religious literature at the time, especially guessing literature in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, they use some very different terms that probably suggest just what a week the translation was from the proto Aramaic to the Greek ones. Uh, during the early period. So when we think about the Bible, even if it's, even if it's, uh, it's a Greek text of, of the Greek uh, um, Gospels, those are themselves translations from a Semitic population to a uh, Hellenistic population that have very different conceptual bases for, for all of these uh, ideas that were being put forth. And so when we think about the indigenous translations, uh, they are speaking uh, to these words in their context, and in my mind, there's there's no question of legitimacy uh, in any of this because we are all, uh, at varying degrees, uh, distant from the uh, from the root text of, of the uh, message. Yeah, very true. But that's why I like the, the term for Jesus probably would use for itself as Yahushua. Which is being God saves. Um, and that gets translated through a lot of processes to get to what we know now as Jesus. That's why they call creator sets free. And the thing that, that I noticed is he said at first he was worried about non indigenous people reading this, but then he figured out maybe it raises awareness. And um, I think that we have just were educated into this very rigid um, version of what all these words mean and, and what it says. And, and I don't know that anybody said, you know, taught us, well, you know, Jesus spoke in us and in a way that was meaningful to the Semitic people and then the Greek people did a Hellenistic version. And now we've got in, and to just raise our awareness that, that there are concepts of God broadens as we um, find the language to um, speak to, I think what he called it, to our heart. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's good for us to be exposed to um, these kinds of translations. Mm -hmm. And like you were last week with the Lord's Prayer too, yeah. just looking at how, yeah. how meaning it, it, the it meaning is for them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, why don't we go ahead and look um, at just a couple of these are lectionaries um, uh, verses from the last New Testament verses from the last few weeks. Um, and I'll go ahead and read them. I know you can see them. They might be a little bit small, um, but I'll read the First Nations version and you can kind of compare it as we're going along with uh, uh, some of these are, you know, it, really there's not a lot of difference even because they too are using English and translating that sometimes the best fit for them is what is written already in English. So um, Luke 20 verses 27 to 33. Then some of the upright ones, the Sadducees, who say there is no rising again from death, came to creator sets free to question him also. Wisdom keeper, they said, in the law, drawn from the water, gave us these instructions. If a tribal member should die before having children, then his brother should marry his widow and give her children. This way, the man will have descendants. In the family of seven brothers, the oldest took a wife, but died without children. The next brother married her, but he also died with no children. A third brother married her, and like his other brothers, he died with no children. The same happened to all seven of them. And last of all, the woman also crossed over to death. When, when they all come back to life in the new world, whose wife should she be since all seven men married her? And then the continuation of that, from the first nation's version. Uh, marriage belongs to this present world and to the ones who live in it, he answered. The ones who are chosen to rise to life in that world will not marry, for they will be like the spirit messengers. They will never die, for they are children of the great spirit who raises them again to new life. And then he said, as to the dead rising again, listen to what the sacred teachings tell us, what drawn from the water said when he saw the burning bush. He calls creator, the great spirit and father, great spirit of father of many nations. He made us laugh and heal grabber. He is not the great spirit of the dead, but of the living. To him all are. 
So again, you see some more of the names, names that are that are used to represent uh, who who these people are, and again the significance of those names. So in uh, Second Thessalonians uh, two one through five. My sacred family members, we have something to say to you about the time when our honored chief, creator set us free, the chosen one, will appear and we will all be gathered around him. Do not be suddenly shaken in your mind or troubled and troubled in your mind, but the day of our chief has already arrived. It does not matter whether you hear it by prophecy or a spoken word or by a written message that someone says came from us. Do not be fooled by anyone. Before that day comes, there must be an uprising a turning away from creator. Then the man who respects no law will be revealed, the son whose father is destruction. He will speak out against and consider himself to be greater than all the so-called powerful spirit beings and all that is seen as sacred or holy. He will even set himself up in the creator's sacred lodge and represent himself as the great spirit. Have you forgotten that when I was still with you, I told you about these things? And continuation that my sacred family members loved by our honored chief we owe thanks to the great spirit for you he has chosen you to be first among those he will set free and make whole as you trust in the truth through his spirit who makes you holy creator used our telling of the good story of the call you to him, to call you to himself so that you would share in the horror that shines from the face of our honor excuse me the honor that shines from the face of our honored chief Creator sets free, the chosen one. So then, my sacred family members, stand strong and hold firmly to the traditions we, we taught you, either by voice or by letter. We are loved by our honored chief, Creator sets free, the chosen one. And by our Father, the Great Spirit, it is through the gift of his great kindness that he has given us good hope and comfort that will never fade away. We pray that he will now lift up your hearts and strengthen you in all the good things you do or say. Got some more, but we're getting close to the end of the time. I know maybe just a general response to some of these. It is uh, Native American History Month, the month of November, um, and a, a great time to, to be looking at uh, the, the expressions of Native American people. Um, and even then, he didn't get into it in this particular version. Uh, First Nations is often a term that's come out of Canada when you're referring to what we often say Indigenous people or Native Americans. Um, and he, he discussed that that was kind of that First Nations understanding is kind of moving into the United States as well, people's understanding. And that's why they use that title. So there could be Indigenous peoples that will often use uh, Native Americans, and even often some Indigenous people will use the term um, Native or uh, Indians. Um, as others we see in, in this world that accept often derogatory terms that are applied to them, to take that on and represent some meaning for them. Um, some of them will do that as well. I know even related to that, Ronnie might be able to speak to it, but the Jump Festival is coming up um, this coming weekend in Cape Harbor. It hasn't been around for a couple of years, uh, but it's celebrating the return of the uh, Chum Salmon to the, the creeks and streams. So this Saturday and Sunday, there'll be a number of things. Uh, Wild Watch, is that the name of the Harbor Wild Watch? Park. Harbor Wild Watch, which I think Ronnie's a member of. Um, they'll be there to, to share some of, again, this is a, a village. At the History Museum. Yeah, okay. At the History Museum is where these events will take place. They came out, I read them, I think, in the, uh, the Now paper, I get Harbor Now. Um, had a little blurb on them. I think the Common News Tribune did too, talking about it. So those are ways that we can uh, be involved in and experience uh, this uh, Indigenous Peoples Month uh, of November. Unless you have some more comments, you want to look at the, this First Nation version of mine to take a peek at it. Um, I, I, I love listening to them talk together. 
I mean, and that's why I wanted to share it. It's better than me trying to explain what, what I hear and read from them. This is them actually speaking, them telling their story, them being engaged in that story. And that's kind of what we need to do as people is to bring others in to, to share and express um, how they look at the things that we hold dear, the sacred life of, of, of Jesus within our understanding of, of God as well. Thanks. Thank you.